Okay, let's move on to actual bone development. So the formation of bone is actually called ossification or osteogenesis. And there's two methods of ossification or osteogenesis. Okay, and that's intramembranous and endochondral. And both begin with soft embryonic connective tissue called mesenchyme. So just to kind of reiterate, the formation of bone is called ossification or osteogenesis. And there's two different methods of ossification. So you either do it intramembranously or and endochondral. And both begin with soft tissue embryonic connective tissue called mesenchyme. So let's go to intramembranous first. Uh, produces the flat bones of the skull and most of the clavicle. Um, usually such bones develop within a fibrous sheet similar to the dermis of the skin. So that sometimes they're called these dermal bones. Um, but let's see if we can go into a little bit more detail here. Um, so mesenchyme first condenses with a soft sheet of tissue permeated with the blood vessel, the membrane to which the intramembranous refers to. And then these mesenchymal cells line up along the blood vessels, become osteoblasts, and secrete a soft collagenous osteotissue. So then the calcium phosphate and other minerals crystallize the collagen fibers of the osteotissue, harden the matrix. And then while foregoing the process or going on, more of the mesenchyme adjacent to the developing bone condenses. And at the surfaces, osteoblasts beneath the periosteum deposit layers of bone. So again, that's a roundabout way of uh, saying, okay, that's how bone ossification occurs in the intramembranous. Now, endochondral produces most of the other bone. So we'll spend most of the time on endochondral bone. Bones develop from hyaline cartilage model. So those are your vertebrae, your ribs, your scapula, your pelvic bones, your limb bones, and uh, some other parts of the skull. And it usually begins around the sixth week of uh, fetal development and continues all the way into a person's 20s. Yeah, all the way into your 20s. It usually ends about 25. So it's two steps. Uh, you have chondrification in which the embryonic mesenchyme condenses and differentiates into a hyaline cartilage model and in the appropriate shape of the bone. And then you have the ossification itself in which the cartilage is broken down and replaced by bone. Um, we'll talk about Paget's disease. Well, you have normal leg bones are relatively straight, but those affected by Paget's disease are porous and curved. And there's a plethora of bone diseases out there. You've heard of osteoporosis, but Paget's disease uh, is another one out there. Um, and we'll go into what can go wrong a little bit later, but here's a good diagram of blood and nerve supply to the bone. You have articular cartilage. You have epiphyseal arteries and veins. You have the periosteum, compact bone. You have the medullary cavity, epiphyseal line. So you can see you have a vast blood supply in the bones. And that's really the, what contributes to your bones healing at a quicker rate. Here's intramembranous uh, ossification. So you have the intramembranous ossification follows four steps. Remember the mesenchyme cells group into clusters and ossification centers form. Then you have secreted osteoidrops, osteoblasts, which then become osteocytes. You have trabecular matrix and the periosteum form. Then you have compact bone develops superficial to the trabecular bone and the crowded blood vessels condense into red marrow. So that's the way of ossification intramembrous. Now the endochondral ossification, so first the mesenchymal cells differentiate into chondrocytes. Then the cartilage model of the future bony skeleton and the pericardium form. Capillaries penetrate the cartilage. Pericardium forms into periosteum. The periosteum color develops. Primary ossification centers develop. The cartilage and the chondrocytes continue to grow at the ends. Secondary ossification centers develop. And the cartilage remains at the epiphyseal growth plate and at joint surfaces of the articular cartilage. So this is your growth plate. So you'll continue to grow here and continue to grow here. And when these epiphyseal plates close, that's when you stop growing longitudinally and then you grow horizontally, which means that you no longer grow taller, but then you end up growing fatter, basically. There's only one way. Once you stop growing taller, you got to go wide. Okay.
So longitudinal bone growth, this is what I was telling you about. That's the epiphyseal plate that's responsible for longitudinal bone growth. So when you look at longitudinal bone growth, uh, you know, really you have to understand where the epiphyseal plates are. So on an x-ray, and I'll show you some uh, examples, the plate appears as a translucent line. Now, what we worry about are fractures along the epiphyseal plate, but usually it consists of a band of typical hyaline cartilage in the middle and a metaphysis on each side. So the metaphysis is where the cartilage thickens by cell division and enlargement and then undergoes replacement by bone. So you have several zones. So here's bones grow along the epiphyseal plates, uh, plates made up of hyaline cartilage and the metaphysis. Okay, so here's the epiphyseal plates. So if you look at this on an x-ray, you think, man, he's got a lot of fractures or what's going on. But this is uh, actually a little kid. And all these epiphyseal plates are still open, so you still have to have bone development. Look at all the, the bones in the hand. They have, actually haven't even fully developed yet. Okay, and these are all the epiphyseal plates. So again, appo appositional growth, which is growth in diameter and thickness. Uh, um, so once you stop growing taller, you grow thicker. Um, how does that happen? Well, you have the intramembrous ossification at the surface, the osteoblast and the periosteum deposit matrix. Once matrix hardened cells become osteocytes and then the circumferential lamellae are formed and the osteoclasts widen the medullary cavity. That way you become thicker. So your bones become thicker. Okay, they'll no longer grow taller. Uh, bone remodeling, well, let's say you break something, well, or just the stress you put on it. Absorption of old bone and deposition of new bone is all based on Wolf's Law of Bone. So bone shape is determined by mechanical stress. Let's say you have someone that's four or 500 pounds. Well, obviously, there's going to be a lot of stress put on the wrong places, so you'll see a lot of them, they'll have their legs bow out, and that's because of Wolf's Law. So bone adapts to withstand stress, and form follows functions. So here's a radiograph of Wolf's Law. So you can see the deformation in the femurs, right? And that's based on the mechanical stress put on bone due to activity or weight. So it could be that they're real obese, the way that they walk, but you can see that curvature that occurs. And you, if you look at the tibia and if you look at the fibula, something uh, is obviously uh, wrong here and as we learn the appendicular skeleton you're like well that's not normal okay so remember you always want to know normal so you can pick out the abnormal right away okay so form always follows function and bones will adapt based on the stress that's put on them uh, progression from epiphyseal plate to epiphyseal line. So how did those growth plates close? Uh, well, as bones mature, the epiphyseal plate progresses to an epiphyseal line. And the epiphyseal plates are visible in a growing bone. But epiphyseal lines are the remembrance of epiphyseal plates in a mature bone. So when you're looking at radiographs or x-rays, that's when you can see an epiphyseal growth plate versus an epiphyseal line. Now, I have had uh, several patients that have uh, been snowboarding or skateboarding, and they've had a fracture at the growth plate. And that will sometimes, due to stress or trauma, close prematurely, and then one leg becomes shorter than the other, or one arm becomes shorter than the other, because there's no longer appositional growth. I'm sorry, not longitudinal growth that's taking place. All right, uh, nutrition uh, is very important. Uh, calcium and phosphate, raw materials for calcified ground substance. Vitamin A promotes formation of gl glucosamoglycans, protein, carb fibers. Vitamin C, of course, is important. Ascor ascorbic acid promotes collagen cross-linking. And vitamin D, of course, calcitriol, uh, necessary for calcium absorption by small intestine and reduces urinary calcium loss. So. All these vitamins, calcium, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, are all important nutritional factors that will lay a foundation. And I think I mentioned to you um, those crazy injuries that occur, you know, those uh, Kevin Wares, Gordon Hayward, uh, Paul George, they didn't have the best nutrition at an early age. Maybe they lacked the calcium, vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin D early on that they didn't really form a good formation. So, you know, I can't stress this 
enough the first two years of your child's life make sure you are promoting good nutrition and lay a strong foundation for their bones especially uh, any cultures that really don't drink a lot of milk um, which is the Asian cultures that don't drink a lot of milk so from an Asian uh, culture standpoint you want to make sure that you're feeding your kids uh, uh, plenty of vitamin A, C, and D and if they're allergic to uh, uh, milk then having substitutes such as uh, almond milk or uh, soy milk with enough calcium or vitamin uh, D that's been added. Um, okay, so fortified. Some hormonal factors. Uh, you have calcitonin, which is secreted by the thyroid gland, stimulates osteoblasts in children and pregnant women. You have growth hormone, promotes intestinal absorption of calcium, stimulates growth plates and bone elongation. Uh, that's sometimes people will take HGH. Uh, Mark McGuire and all those guys used to take HGH. But the thing is, they, their epiphyseal plates is closed, so instead of getting taller, they just got thicker and wider, uh, still stronger. Uh, and then estrogen and testosterone, which are sex steroids, stimulate long bone growth during adolescence. So you have to be careful with taking those uh, steroids during uh, puberty. And then you have parathyroid hormone secreted by parathyroid glands, stimulates bone of reabsorption to boost level of calcium in the blood. So there's a lot of hormonal factors that take place. And when we do the endocrine system, of course, we'll uh, spend a little bit more time on growth, HGH, human growth hormone, estrogen, progesterone, uh, testosterone, calcitonin, all those. Oh, what about the aging skeletal system? Well, unfortunately, as you age, uh, the bones are become osteopenia, which is loss of bone. When severe, it develops into osteoporosis. The reabsorption is faster than deposition. So after age of 35, the osteoblasts are less active than the osteoclasts. So that's a very good physiological way that you can look at it. Well, how does that occur? Well, osteoblasts are less active than osteoclasts. So osteoclasts are breaking down bone faster than osteoblast making uh, bone right so after age 40 females you lose eight percent of your bone mass per decade males you lose three percent of bone mass and fractures are very common and you heal very slowly after the age of 40. Um, so let's say you have the unfortunate event of getting fractures what are the different kinds of fractures well you have stress fractures which are caused by abnormal trauma you can have a pathological fracture, which occurs in bone weakened by a disease such as osteoporosis. Classified according to the breaking of the skin, direction of fracture, and separation of bone pieces. So I'll show you how to name those fractures. How do you treat them? There's two different ways you can do it. You can close reduction, so that's non-surgical manipulation, so that's usually a cast. Or you can do an open reduction, which is surgical setting, involves plate screws or pins. Okay. And healing time, it depends on how old you are. It can be anywhere from 6 to 8 to 12 weeks. Oh, yeah, that's that's got to hurt there. Oof. Look at that. That's, that's multiple. That, that might take on the uh, 12 to 16 week uh, problem. That's not going to be 6 weeks right there. This is going to need surgery, pins and screws and all sorts of things. That's what snowboarding does. Yeah, have fun with that. And look at that. That is no good. That's a spiral fracture of the femur. Um, that's no good either. That's going to take a while to heal. So, ooh, that's, this is not a fracture, but I just wanted to point this out that you never want to upset your wife or your girlfriend. Uh, these are both pictures that are actual images taken from the ER where uh, the significant other was a little upset. So this is... Um, the wife was uh, a little upset, uh, probably, um, that he was watching a Laker game and uh, didn't listen to her, so this this occurred. And then this was right through the eye. Um, so instant death, unfortunately, for both of these. So you got to be careful. Um, don't upset the wife or the girlfriend. So <clears throat> classification of fractures, uh, again, uh, you do have to know these. Uh Closed fracture, that means the skin is not broken, formally called a simple fracture. Open is when the skin is broken, the bone protrudes through the skin. Don't worry, I won't show you images, but I think you can visually see that. A complete fracture mean when, means when a bone is broken into two or more pieces. Incomplete, partial fracture that extends only partway across the bone. 
non-displaced, the portions of bone are still in correct anatomical alignment. Displaced means the portions of bone are out of anatomical alignment. So when you read a medical chart and if something says, oh, patient suffered an open, displaced, hairline fracture, et cetera, et cetera, it doesn't even make sense because if a hairline fracture is a fine crack in which sections of the bone remain aligned, well, it's, it's not going to break the skin then. So make sure you're using right terminology when you're describing a fracture. A green stick is bone is bent toward one side. Remember when you break like a, a soft stick and you get the two ends, but the, the middle is still intact. So that's called a green stick fracture. Impacted, one bone fragment is driven into the marrow cavity or spongy bone of the other. Oh, those are those are tough to heal. And then depressed, broken portion of bone forms a concavity as in skull fractures. Um, so we don't like those as well. It's like somebody hitting you with a baseball bat on your skull. That would be a depressed fracture. So here's a, 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 some good examples. So here's a closed fracture. See, it stayed within, the skin's intact, and anatomical alignment. Open, it protrudes the skin. Transverse fracture, right there. You get a spiral fracture, a commuted fracture, okay, several pieces. They impacted where they kind of drive into each other. The green stick, where it's just a little fracture. Kids get green stick fractures quite often, and then an oblique fracture, very similar to a spiral fracture, but uh, as, as you can see, this spiral kind of rotates around. Um, had a patient that did that who was osteoporotic while he was uh, water skiing. Okay. Now, let's say you do get a, a fracture. Well, how does it heal? Well, it's going to it's going to take some time, but the healing of a bone fracture follows uh, obviously a series of steps. So fracture hematoma forms. So you get this hematoma. Then you have internal external cali forming. So you see, you get a callus here, you get a callus here. So usually on the x-ray or the radiograph, once this callus starts to form, you'll be able to visually see it. Okay. Now in part C, the cartilage of the cali is replaced by trabecular bone, so and then the callus is replaced with this trabecular bone, and then in D, that the remodeling occurs. Now this whole process can take anywhere from 6 to 12 weeks. If the fracture is commuted, obviously you need some guidance, so you might need some screws and plates to help form that callus, and a lot of times those screws and plates will stay there even after the fracture heals. All right, the importance of vitamin D. Sunlight is one good source of vitamin D, so you want to prevent fractures. You want to stay healthy. So sunlight, vitamin D is ingested through food and supplements absorbed by the intestines carried to the liver via the bloodstream. Vitamin D is manufactured in the skin after the absorption of sunlight. So you can either eat it or you can absorb it through the sunlight. Those are two sources. So what does the liver do? Once in the liver, vitamin D turns into 25-OH calcidiol, the primary form of circulating vitamin D. And in the kidneys, vitamin D is transferred into 125-calcitriol, a biologically active form of vitamin D. So really the liver and the kidneys play a huge role in vitamin D synthesis. And the synthesis of IMD facilitates calcium absorption from the small intestine, calcium reabsorption from the kidneys, and rebuilding of bone tissue. So everything works together. Now remember, the darker you are, the less you're going to absorb from the sun, so you're going to have to ingest the vitamin D. Okay. If you're fair-skinned, you can absorb a lot of it through the sun, but the problem with being fair-skinned, like we talked about in the skin part, is you run the risk of skin cancer. So always get your vitamin D levels checked. Uh, like I was telling you, uh, it really acts like a hormone. Make sure the liver and the kidneys are doing their job and it facilitates calcium absorption. Graph showing relationship between age and bone mass. So females, males, let's see, you get peak bone mass for males in their 20s, for females in their early, uh, mid 20s, 30s, and then it starts to go downhill, especially for females and uh, uh, like real thin Caucasian women and thin Asian women are very susceptible to osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is bone mass mass and become subject to pathological fractures. The hip, wrist, vertebrae are especially vulnerable. You get a kyphosis that's sometimes called the dowager's hump, exaggerated thoracic curvature. Some of it is genetic 
postmenopausal white light build women are at greatest risk but as newer studies show that Asian women are at high risk as well and that's usually due to a decline of estrogen results in less inhibition of osteoclasts and by age 70 have typically lost almost 50 percent of bone mass which is quite a bit uh, what do you how do you treat it you can get bisphosphonates and parathyroid hormone and how do you prevent osteoporosis weight bearing exercise and adequate Get adequate calcium and protein so this is just a pathway to calcium homeostasis how do you keep this so here's the homeostasis remember you want your body is always working to keep everything uh, even so the thyroid gland usually releases calcitonin the osteoclast activity is inhibited so you're not breaking down calcium is reabsorbed in the kidneys is decreased and then calcium level and blood decreases. So that's when you have too much calcium, right? Now, if you have too little calcium, what's going to happen is the parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone. The osteoclasts release calcium from the bone. Calcium is reabsorbed by the urine, by the kidneys, because you don't want to get rid of it. So we reabsorb that calcium. And calcium absorption in the small intestine increases as you increases via vitamin, vitamin D synthesis. So when you have low calcium, it's also important to take vitamin D um, and calcium level in the blood increases. So this is that cycle of physiology of homeostasis. It's a good little uh, chart to uh, recognize and memorize. There's the cell cycle and here's a long lady with the dowager's hump and extreme kyphosis. Now what about some problems? Remember I mentioned Paget disease early R, but but Here's structural disorders of the bone in orthopedics, prevention, correction of injuries, and disorders of bones, joints, and muscles. You have acromegaly, which is a result of adult growth hormone hypersecretion, resulting in thickening of the bones and soft tissues. And Andre the Giant and the great Kali for wrestlers have acromegaly. Uh, and you have Paget's disease, which is excessive osteoclast proliferation and bone resorption, with osteoblasts attempting to compensate by de depositing extra bone. This results in rapid disorderly bone remodeling and weak deformed bones. Uh, so it's most common in males over the age of 50. So you get very extreme deformities of long bones here. And then osteosarcoma, anything with coma we don't like, that's bone cancer affecting especially the limb bones of adolescents and young adults. Produces large tumors often near the knee with death if not quickly treated. So here's the acromegaly, remember under the giant, and then the great Kali. Then you have rickets, which is a defective mineralization of bone in children, usually as a result of insufficient sunlight or vitamin D. So you can see how vitamin D is constantly showing up, sometimes due to dietary deficiency or calcium or phosphate, or to liver or kidney diseases that interfere with calcitriol synthesis. It causes bone softening and deformity, and especially of the weight-bearing limbs. So a lot of things here that you want to be aware of. All right, very good.